Hi, this is Bob Roth, managing partner and co-founder of Cypress Home Care Solutions. Since 1994, we have been providing in-home supportive care services for our older adult population right here in Phoenix, Arizona. Since 2014, we've been bringing you a show on Money Radio called Health Futures, Taking Stock in You. In case you miss our show that airs every Friday at noon, you can catch it right here on our podcast called Health Futures, Taking Stock in You. So when you get a chance, listen in and enjoy the show. The views expressed on the following program do not necessarily reflect the views of Money Radio staff, management, or advertisers and do not represent an offer to buy or sell any securities. It's time for Health Futures with Cypress Home Care Solutions, Bob Roth. This is Arizona's only show dedicated to providing you with expert advice on how to live a longer, healthier, and happier life. To learn more, call 602-264-8009. That's 602-264-8009. Now, here's your host, Bob Roth. Good afternoon. You're listening to Health Futures Taking Stock and You. I'm your host, Bob Roth, and it must be Friday, and indeed it is. We're coming at you live from the Scottsdale Air Park Money Radio Studios, 1510 AM, 105.3 FM, and the World Wide Web, moneyradio1510.com. We're also podcasting now, and you can catch us you can catch us on podcast. If this is the first time you're tuning into our show, our show is about how our older adult population can live a healthier, happier life. How do they do that? They do that not by listening to me, but to these extraordinary guests that I have on the show. So today's no different. Uh, I have a great guest here on the show. It's somebody I've been just monitoring and watching on the social feeds and the work that she is doing. And I'm really honored to have you here in the really the heart of the middle of the month of February, which is Heart Health Month. Mia Chorney, she is a nurse practitioner, cardiology, Honor Health Medical Group. Welcome to Health Futures. Thank you, Bob. Really honored to be here with you today. Well, I'm honored to have you here. And, you know, I, I usually have people give a little bit about their bio in the second segment, but I think it's really important for not only me, but our listeners to know a little bit about you because my listeners know that my passion is caregiving and it is because of my personal journey with my mom. And my passion also is heart health because of my mom's, my mom's journey as, all, as well as my father's journey. And here we are talking about hearts. And you have a similar situation in the sense that this is a personal journey of yours. And it's also a professional journey of yours as well. So Mia, if you could indulge me as well as our listeners, tell us a little bit about you and your background and how you found heart health. Thank you so much. I, you're very right. We just talked about how when we become passionate about something, usually we've had a lived experience, something that drives that why of where we're at. So my story is, it, 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 it was my whole beginning at 32. I was a young mom. I had a just a new four-year-old at home, and I had a newborn. She was probably about six months at the time. And at that time, I was the director of the operating room. And I remember uh, being in a room, checking on the staff. I was physically in one of the operating rooms. And while I was in there, it was a day like any other day. I'd woke up, felt great. I was a very fit woman, very, very athletic. And the last thing I remember is looking to the left. I could still see the OR bed sitting there. But I, from what I'm told, I made it all the way out into through the big double doors that you see on TV, you know, going through the OR doors. Mm -hmm. I made it out into the hallway and someone said I said a couple words and the next thing you knew, I fell straight back and uh, cracked my head open. Oh, I bet you did. Oh, oh. and mm -hmm. uh, again, I remember none of this and they called a code. And the next thing I remember was uh, a few hours later waking up in emergency covered in blood and uh, my family beside me and I had not a clue what had happened. No warning of what was going on. After a long journey of a lot of testing, um, it took quite some time. I was in ICU, sleeping with a heart rate of 100. 
They were trying to ambulate me, get me moving. My heart rate was spiking to 160, 180. And I was in a smaller community, so I ended up needing to get medevaced out. And I went to a larger tertiary center where they discovered I had a really uh, unhealthy arrhythmia problem mm. and had to go through a lot of investigation and treatment at the time. So that absolutely fuels my passion for women's heart disease, um, trying to be a massive advocate for where we need to go in healthcare. You know, there's so many myths out there about mm -hmm. heart disease, right? And you look incredible. And I know you said you're athletic and you're physically fit. You know, you really don't expect someone that is physically fit to have a heart issue. And, you know, there's so many contributing factors, obviously. Genetics are a big piece. And I, you know, I'm going to ask you that question. I mean, do you have genetic history? or I no? do not. Wow. Isn't that mysterious, yeah, right? Yeah, it really is. No genetic predisposition whatsoever to arrhythmia. Neither of my parents had heart disease. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. What a what a roller coaster that must have been for you, especially in the prime of your life. Yeah. And tell me, tell me what, wh where you're at now, wh how things progressed. Uh, you know, how did how did they solve that arrhythmia problem? Yeah. So great question. I. You know, just you asking me about my family history. Well, like, no, my grandmother lived to 107. Wow. My grandfather passed away at 99 in my one side of my family. And my mom and dad did pass in their 80s, but still great longevity in life without heart disease. So after I got through all that, and it was a long journey of a lot of testing, a lot of trying to figure it out. Six months later, I, I dropped a ton of weight. I weighed 99 pounds, my heart running around so fast all the time. But I recovered got well, uh, got off cardiac medications, and I've actually done fantastic until recently. Mm. We just, you know, kind of ch chatted about, and I found myself here. I was, I am 57 today. Right. You look amazing. Today? Today. Your birthday? No, not today, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that's where I'm at right now, and I've continued to live a really healthy lifestyle. In I was uh, last year training to do the rim to rim, so mm -hmm. I was one of those crazy people who wanted to get that done, doing a lot of long haul training. And a couple of times it was interesting, I was out there on the trail, we know it gets hot here, you know, and it can be a little dry, but I'm super well prepared every time I get out there. And one day I had to lay down on the trail. I was feeling really unusually nauseous, just kind of fuzzy in my head. You know when you get that kind of sound in your head like you think you're going to faint you know you kind of get that warning sign I get that when I do hot yoga there you go <laughs> I mean, when I stand up and just like oh my gosh yeah so I had that out on the trail and I said to my husband I gotta lay down something's going on looked at my watch my heart rate was 180 whoa yeah shouldn't be like that right no. when someone's physically fit so I didn't wasn't sure what was going on had to lay there for a while a guy on a bike came by we said hey if I'm not out in two hours because I had four miles to get out. You're going to have to send someone in. Ma managed to get out, but uh, didn't think anything of it, right? Mm. Kind of played it down, right? Mm. That's not good. And a lot of people do that. We do that. You yes. know, we just kind of can be dismissive of our symptoms mm. and think, hey, it's just a bad day or I'm getting older or, you know, something like that's going on. But then in November, I had an incident where I simply went downstairs to make a cup of coffee. And I was alone that day. Our kids are grown and don't live at home anymore. My husband was at work. And all of a sudden, I had that feeling again. I was like, whoa, my head's not clear, don't feel great. And I called my husband at work. And I said, you need to come home. Something's going on. I feel like I'm going to go down. I'm going to black out. So it takes him a while to get home. He doesn't work close to home. But anyhow, long story short, EMS came, neighbor came. And at that time, I had pretty much recovered. I'd felt fine, but um, kind of felt embarrassed, right? To have called someone to come and thinking, oh my goodness. They really recommended that I go to a higher level of care. So I did get in the ambulance and went on my merry way. But then when I got to the emergency department, I ended up bringing myself home before being seen. Mm. And I felt, uh, again, just embarrassed. You know, being a woman, attending on site, I had had people say, do you have anxiety? Do you have anything like that? And I was like, no. So here I am now, and within the last two weeks, uh, I will share that I ended up discovering I probably have an arrhythmia again. You know, was at work, kindly with all my cardiology uh, partners, 
and we ended up putting a remote monitor on me and did reveal, no, I did not have anxiety or anything. I was revealing an arrhythmia again. So you never know, you know, you could have uh, an unwell health condition and things can come back again. We don't know why, you know, we were questioning whether I'd had COVID or something like that. I've gone through cardiac MRIs and EP, so I'm still under study, but I'm very, very grateful for our cardiology community and, you know, the care I'm getting. You know, it's interesting. We're getting ready to break on the first segment. We'll go to the second segment, but I wanted to ask you, do you think those, those emergency response team members would have said the same thing to a man you know you're suffering from anxiety i mean we've had we've had these discussions here on my show with other doctors cardiologists and i think you know the way they treat women versus men are very different we can talk a little more about that that's a great lead into the next conversation for sure i i agree well mia i really appreciate you sharing this story with me and i know it's very personal and it really has fueled your passion for the Mm -hmm. work you do and you did share with me, you, you've got a big trip coming up next year. That's really exciting that you get to talk about this, not just here domestically, but internationally. I do. I'm very excited. I am too for you. You're listening to How Futures Taking Stock and You. I've got Mia Chorney here in the studio with me. We're talking about heart health. We're talking about women's health. Stick around. We'll be right back. Now back to Health Futures, taking stock in you. If you have questions about your own or your loved one's future health care, call 602-264-8009. Now, here's your host, Cypress Home Care Solutions, Bob Roth. Welcome back. You're listening to Health Futures, Taking Stock in You. I'm your host, Bob Roth. And if you're just tuning in here, I have got Mia Chorney. She's a doctor of nurse practitioner over cardi uh, over at honor health and cardiology and she has shared with us her personal journey into her own experience with heart health and if you missed that first segment go up to our website at cypresshomecare.com click on the media button right below it is radio show you'll catch this one and many many more so Mia, i i really thank you for sharing that story with me and you know look this has been a journey for you and, and when you had that experience happen to you back 25 years or 24 years ago you're dating me I know <laughs> and 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 I can't believe you say how old you are because you look like you're 20 years younger than that so whatever you're doing you're doing it right but but when you were doing that work as a nurse practitioner back in those days were you in cardiology too then because I know you're here in cardiology mm-hmm. No, I was not actually. I was the director of the operating room at ah. the time and all those other teams, yeah, Got in, it. A, in, a, in a hospital. So th- your journey into the cardiology side is personal, and that's why you chose to do that. It is, absolutely. Wow, fascinating, fascinating. So we were talking about you know women versus men, and I've talked about it here on the show. Symptoms are very different. You talked about how the EMS folks were talking about maybe you had some anxiety um, symptoms that men typically have or the chest and clutching it um, women's symptoms are very different and you know, I would love for you to describe for us what some of those symptoms are and and for me I am just amazed at what women do I mean you guys as a gender can do multitasking like no one no one's business you can do it far better than men can and you can not only be able to be you know, a great mother, a great wife, um, keeping a household going, but also working. Uh, you, you're able to do all of those things and, and, and do it all at once, which is fascinating. And certainly stress does come along with that. Mm-hmm. Please, if you would, share with us some of the signs and symptoms that we should be looking for in women, but people that are even around women, and they should be looking for those signs as well. Yeah, so it's really important that our listeners and, you know, people understand that women are not small men. We are, you know, hormonally different, physiologically different. So it's not a a valid assumption to think that we're going to come and present with the same symptoms as men. So women can come in and just describe symptoms like atypical fatigue. I just don't feel right. I feel off. They might come in and say, I'm just not able to exercise like I used to be able to. 
A lot of those symptoms, though, we might attribute to other reasons, aging, things like that. But you're very right. Women don't necessarily come in with crushing chest pain, you know, diaphoresis. Like you would see on TV, that guy's sweating. He's got this heavy elephant on his chest. And yes, those are valid symptoms Mm -hmm. that can happen to a woman. But we want people to also know that the American Heart Association and ACC, which is American Cardiology Association, has redone what the symptoms are. And they do say things like fatigue and just some shortness of breath and feeling off. All those symptoms can relate to heart disease. And even lower back pain, right? Yeah, it can I mean, radiate right through, you know, coming through. Yes, absolutely. Right. right. And, and the stressors that women feel don't it, they don't necessarily share those they compartmentalize those so i mean you don't really know and even if you ask you may not know but if you know the person and you can you can see maybe the anguish on their face or the challenges that they're dealing with or maybe the fact that they're not sleeping correct and i want to allude to when you were saying about the difference of symptoms in the united states the number one cause of our maternal population so our pregnant population is heart disease So when we're looking at death rates of men and women, but we're also looking at our pregnant population, I want everyone to know the number one cause of death for our pregnant population is heart disease. Wow. You know, one of the things that Dr. Martha Galati shared right here on the show is that, you know, women in their pregnancy, if they're suffering from Mm preeclampsia, they're suffering from um, what's it called? Uh, diabetes, yeah. uh, gesta- gestational, gestational diabetes, and arrhythmias, all of those things, she used to say, is kind of a precursor to later in life having heart issues, which mm-hmm. they didn't know before. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if you could talk a little bit about that, and women who have gone through some of those things probably need to go visit not only just their primary care, but get a workup done cardio from a cardiologist. Yeah, the um, the incidence of mortality of our pregnant population, the United States actually has the highest death rate of any developed country in the Isn't world right crazy? now. Isn't that crazy? It's phenomenal, like it's right. scary. Yeah. And in, in, so why is that, right? Why are we seeing that our women in the United States with this incredible healthcare system are dying and most women will die within 42 days of discharge, so very early. So we want to make sure, though, when we're looking at those stats, why is that? Well, the United States has provided some exceptional care to women who perhaps would not have been able to have babies way back when, right? So that that makes kind of sense, right? Perhaps that wouldn't have been able to carry or or even be alive Mm -hmm. to get into that stage. But also we have a lot of technology now. We have a lot of in vitro fertilization going on. And you you nailed it. We have women very dynamic, very hardworking, and they're having babies later in life, right? So other health conditions can be going on with that. And then just some of the issues of, you know, perhaps poor eating, those sort of things that are going on within our country. So we really want to make sure that when that mom, and again, it's not dismissed, calls you and says, hey, I'm really short of breath, I'm tired, I'm feeling, you know, not well. What do we say to her? We say, oh, welcome to new motherhood, right? Right. But no, we want to make sure that we're listening and maybe she does need to seek a higher level of care. Interesting. You know, you talked about women having babies late in life. You know, I shared with you off the air that I have three daughters and Mm -hmm. one, my youngest, is a labor and delivery nurse over at Cedar sinai in L.A. And she shared with me the other day, 59-year-old mother. Is that I'm crazy? I'm speechless. I know. I am <laughs> too. I mean, 59. Wow. I mean, women are definitely having, I mean, most of them aren't that old, but you know, women are having babies in their late 30s and 40s yep. at a much more rapid rate than they ever have in the past. Correct. But there is definitely that correlation between pregnancy and heart disease. Yeah. And that can shift us right into things like menopause. We know that menopause is contributory as well for us for heart disease right as we lose our estrogen those sort of things so it's really important that we know those women out there who have premature estrogen loss perhaps they had chemotherapy or they had surgical resection of their ovaries you know we know before the age of 45 if they experience that 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 increases our risk of heart disease as well so looking at that whole hormonal spectrum is incredibly important for us 100 percent. yeah 100 percent so I really, you know, want to finish off this second segment talking about genetics and how important genetics are. And, and in your journey, mm-hmm. genetics didn't really play a role into it. You know, in my journey, I lost both my parents mm-hmm. to 
heart disease. My mother at a very young age at 66, 48 years old was when she had a massive heart attack. Mm -hmm. And my dad just a year and a half ago in November of 22, but he lived with a bad heart for a long time. Yeah. So we may not get it finished, but talk about the importance of knowing your genetics. Yeah. So knowing your family history is extremely important. So when you have a mother who has a cardiac event, before the age of you know 65 or a man before the age of 55 that's a highlight for us and so for you you had a mom very young have a history of cardiac disease but I don't know if you know but I do specialize in cardiac genetics I, I do know a, that. yeah I do a lot of the cardiac genetic testing and on our health uh, it's kind of been one of my um, major uh, passions as well that I've added on. Mm -hmm. So with genetics though in heart disease there is not a single gene that contributes to coronary artery heart disease or placking of the coronary arteries. It's more polygenetic right so it comes from multiple factors. Um, but then you can look at other genetic predispositions like arrhythmias right mm -hmm. that I have or looking at long QT or dilated hearts which are car cardiomyopathy that does have you know a real implication in heart disease for those families so i do see a lot of patients at honor health that get referred to me strictly for cardiac genetic counseling testing and guidance on what they should be doing for their families and them and and that's the important thing is what should they be doing i mean there's pharmacological uh, things that you can do but there's also things you can do as it relates to lifestyle in terms of exercise and eating better right a hundred percent so when we're looking at coronary artery disease so that is where the polygenetics comes in and the literature tells us that let's say you are at higher risk for heart disease maybe you have family hyperlipidemia or something like that going on we know we can shift your curve by you taking on a healthy lifestyle and lowering your risk like someone who did not have genetic predisposition well, I tell you what, I, I love you sharing that with us and sharing that with our listeners as well. You know, I, I know that, you know, on our segment sheet, we're going to talk about social determinants of health. And maybe we, we lead right into that in the third segment. You're listening to Health Futures Taking Stock in You. I've got Mia Chorney here in the studio with me. We're talking heart health. Stick around. It's halftime here. We'll be right back. I hope you're enjoying the show. This is your host, Bob Roth. Managing Partner and Co-Founder of Cypress Home Care Solutions. If you have any questions about the topics that are discussed during the show, visit us online at cypresshomecare.com or give us a call at 602-264-8009. We are entering now the second half of our show, so stay tuned for more helpful information to assist you with your aging loved ones. Now back to Health Futures, taking stock in you. If you have questions about your own or your loved one's future health care, call 602-264-8009. Now, here's your host, Cypress Home Care Solutions, Bob Roth. Welcome back. You're listening to Health Futures, taking stock in you. I'm your host, Bob Roth. And if you're just tuning in, we're in our second half here. I've got Mia Chorney here in the studio with me. We're talking heart health. She is a, a doctor of nurse practitioner, and she's over at the cardiology group, and she's so passionate about cardiology. She's had her own personal journey, and she shared that with us in the first half. And if you missed that, please go up to our website at cypresshomecare.com. Click on the media button. Radio shows right below that, and you can catch this one and many, many more. So when we ended our first or half of the second segment, we were really talking about you know, genetics and how important genetics play. And we teed up this segment talking about social determinants of health. And SDOH is kind of like a big term that we mm -hmm. use in healthcare today because it really is a determining factor of a person's health. And I would love for you to do a deeper dive into this because as I shared with you, I did a webinar the other day and talking about the age difference between people in South Phoenix versus people in Scottsdale and way up in North Phoenix is about 17 years. And, um, you know, you've done your own studies as it relates to women and, and their health. And I think you said it was like 15 years difference. Mm -hmm. You know, how important is this role and how do we keep people alive longer? 
Yeah, thank you so much. So the social determinants of health really does play into our um, and our health. It, and I know that sounds rhetorical, but you know our access to food, our exercise, those sort of things, and our genetics do play into our health. There's no question. You can't change your genes, right? So perhaps you're going to inherit a gene that will cause dilated heart or an arrhythmia. But boy, what we do about that and getting out there and uh, looking at what we're eating and exercise are important. So I sit on the American Heart Association executive leaders for Go Red for Women. Mm. And our latest analysis was that between you know South Phoenix and North Scottsdale, we had a 15 year age difference for life expectancy in our women. Wow. And so I was sharing with you, you know, one of the things that's really incredible as as people or as providers or nurses or whoever we are is going to the Robert Wood Foundation and you can type in your zip code and you can see what is the average age of death of where you live. And people always say to me, well, why would I want to know that? Well, like we're talking about our socioeconomics. Can we afford food? Do we have access to food? Do we feel safe to get out walking? You know, is it too dark? There's no lights. Are we going to get out there and hustle and move our bodies if we're busy working odd shifts? And in that, we know that, you know, socioeconomics is 40% of our health outcome to see, you know, what we have. And actually 20% is only clinical care. So a lot of other things play into our average age of death. Well, you, you know, you, you think about it, so much of it, and we've learned so much as it relates to, you know, science and health and, you know, so much of it is what you eat. And you talked mm -hmm. about moving, too. And, I mean, look, you know, I grew up in the era where fast food was a part of my lifestyle. It's not anymore. I mean, come on. I mean, the, the French fries are great at McDonald's. I don't know what they put in them. You know, and In-N-Out burgers are really good. Uh, but, you know, nowadays, you know, the $5 footlongs aren't really available anymore. But, uh, you know, eating a balanced diet is mm -hmm. so important and, and cutting out those those fats that are in those fries and in those burgers is real important as well. It's super important. Yeah. And, and certainly, you know, you know, food scarcity um, or food insecurity mm -hmm. is, is a big problem for the populations that you just talked about as well. It is. It's, you know, some people just don't have access to things that we wish they could perhaps um, be able to consume. So how do we solve for this? I mean, I, it's a big problem. I mean, I've talked about trying to solve the long-term care problem and educating consumers about preparing for the day when you can't stay home alone. You know, how do we prepare people to live a b healthier life and, and get access to health care? You know, I, I know you serve on a number of these different boards and, and you're very, very active in that. Um, it may not be a one size fits all, but right. how do we do this? So one of the initiatives we decided to do at Honor Health and through the Women's Heart Center is we started group medical visits. And it's a really uh, novel idea here locally. So I love to have 20 women in a room, get them together. And these are not women who've had bypass or have had heart surgery. These are women who perhaps really need to get out there. They know they need some exercise don't really want to join a gym and get in the gym in their tights and everything, feel uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right? So we started a program where we're providing them two hours with us versus, you know, 15 minutes, 30 minutes in a provider visit. And we go over the signs and symptoms of heart disease. We cover, you know, safe exercise. We teach them warm up, cool down. We give them bands and they get on the mats. And they, when they leave, they have what I call it, it's a personalized exercise prescription that is tailored to them to wow. help them get started. And that's one way, right? Joining, joining somewhere where you can enjoy what you're doing, understand what you should be doing. And our recommendation, you know, we're supposed to be trying to get 90 to 150 minutes of movement a week. Mm. And for a lot of people, that's hard, right? And, and you, you talked about how difficult it is in some of these areas where, yeah. you know, it's not really great to be even walking outdoors, let alone at night. Yeah. I mean, certainly us here in North Scottsdale, I mean, you've got mm -hmm. trails, you've got mountains, you've got, you know, weather right now. Yep. Uh, too bad the weather wasn't like this for the Phoenix Open last week, yeah. but I mean, it is absolutely gorgeous out and taking a hour w long walk or even a half an hour long walk is an easy thing to do. Yeah. 
So when they leave things like the group visit, but just suggestions for people out there, getting some bands, getting some stuff you can do at home. I do a lot of flying and a lot of traveling. So I have stuff in my suitcase, right? Because it's not always convenient. Right. It's not. And sometimes I'm just too tired. It doesn't fit in. But we know it takes 30 days to build a habit. So sometimes, you know, trying to figure out something that you could love, something that you could enjoy. And I like people to change it up. Don't always do the same thing. Right. right? You know, shake it up. And the same thing with eating. Yep. You, you shake it up. I mean, you, yep. you need to really mix in different types of foods. Correct. No, I, and I think that's good advice. I mean, you know, for us, it's, it's you know, going back to the second segment is knowing your genetics. Mm-hmm but also knowing your numbers mm-hmm. and, and getting out mm-hmm. to seeing your PCP. And I mean, you know, look, managed health pl- care plans, they, you know, the bane of their existence is having their members not getting in to see their PCP because they don't know what they have. But you as an individual need to know your numbers. And if you don't know your numbers, you need to get in to see your primary care. That's why they say go to get an annual fair physical, yeah. right? Yep. And so then the big numbers for heart disease, know your blood pressure. It's called the silent killer, and it's called that because we don't often feel that our blood pressure is going up. You know, it's just like having diabetes. We don't necessarily feel those changes going on in our body, but our blood pressure must be less than 130 over 80. So making sure people know that. If you're at the supermarket, then stick your arm in the thing, or if you're at a friend's and they have a blood pressure cuff, take it. But we want people to know their numbers. It really is important, and especially in women. We know that a blood pressure of 10 millimeters of mercury greater than normal increases a woman's risk of heart disease 25%. What? Yeah. Repeat that again, please. So 10 millimeters of mercury, higher than it's supposed to be, increases a woman's risk of heart disease 25%. And, And how do you control that? So perhaps it's, you know, decreasing your salt, looking at what you're eating, less processed food, losing some weight, and maybe it does need medication, right? Mm -hmm. But making sure that our uh, population's getting out there and seeing their PCP is really important. Uh, And and it's interesting, you know, you talk about blood pressure cuffs, you know, and and maybe we finish up this third segment talking about some of the tech that's available Mm -hmm. because, you know, you talked about your own personal journey with you know, being on a hike and, and yep. knowing that you were 180, you know, you got your watch. There's there's lots of different instruments mm-hmm. out there that you can use to monitor. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of the tech that's available? Yeah, so wearables are uh, very novel and very in. We love wearables. So when my patients come in with a watch, palpitations, you know, those sort of things. Uh, a lot of the watches, Fitbits, you know, Garmin, Apple, even the Aura Ring now, you know, can give us a lot of great data. How much are we moving our body? Are we getting out there? And it kind of is a great tracker for that. Tells you your heart rate. A lot of them tell you your sleep. We know we need seven hours of sleep a night. It's not good to have 10, but it's not good to have five, right? So you want to be in that seven to eight uh, hour zone. So all those come from wearables and they are outstanding. I love wearables as far as that. And then looking at the other tech is just having that blood pressure cuff as well. Really important to be able to have that. I have one at home. You know? We're not, ab- not able to do blood pressure yet on the devices yet. Correct. Yeah. No, not on a wearable. They're not accurate for that. But it gives you a lot of great data. Well, it does. And it certainly gives you where your pulse rate is, too. And, yeah. and that, that's really important. Yeah. Yours gives an ECG, right? Uh, Yours that you have. Got, yeah. We could download and get a single lead ECG. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. But the crazy thing is, is that... It does so much, and I only know about how much it does, right? So <laughs> it's like my computer. I know I'm only using about 10% of its capacity. You know, I need to We're use all more. like that, yeah. You know, you, you brought up something, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about it in the last segment, the fourth segment, how important sleep is. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, sleep is something that people just don't get enough of. Mm-hmm. And you don't get enough of it when you're younger. You don't get enough of it when you're older. And how important sleep is to heart health. Mm-hmm. You're listening to Health Futures, Taking Stock in You. I'm your host, Bob Roth. I got Mia Chorney here in the studio. We're talking heart health. It is February Heart Health Month, and it also is National Caregiving Month. And we are honoring those 53 million, 54 million caregivers that are out there that are doing the hard work, family caregivers. They're unsung heroes. Stick around. We'll be right back. Now back to Health Futures, taking stock in you. 
If you have questions about your own or your loved one's future health care, call 602-264-8009. Now, here's your host, Cypress Home Care Solutions, Bob Roth. Welcome back. You're listening to Health Futures Taking Stock and You. I'm your host, Bob Roth. And if you're just tuning in, we're in our fourth segment here. And I have got Mia Chorney here in the studio with me. She's from Honor Health, and she is talking cardiology. More importantly, she's talking heart health. February is Heart Health Month. Go Red Month. It's a big month to really to really concentrate on hearts. And if people don't really realize it, it's because it's Valentine's Month, right? It was just Valentine's mm-hmm. Day a couple of days ago. And I'm just so honored and pleased to have you and get a chance to finally meet you because I've seen the work that you've done. And, mm-hmm. and really, you are a great you know, ambassador and, and getting the message out to so many. And I love that I have you in here and we're using this platform to really educate not just our listeners and hopefully through our podcast we'll educate many many more about the work that you're doing so thank you so much for being here thank you so you know I I, there's so much that I want to end with and I want to make sure we cover a number of different things we talked about social determinants of health in the last segment you know you did something that you shared with me on the break uh, with Mayo and would love for you to just take us a little bit through that. I think that's important for us to share. Um, And then I want to do a deeper dive in some of the other things. Okay. So I just wanted to share when we we talked a little bit about, you know, polygenetic, uh, polygenetics for heart health or just our genetics, you know, what do we inherit from our families? And, you know, we can't change our genes. So with my, one of my roles is I'm become very passionate in cardiac genetic testing and I was very blessed I was invited by Dr. Michael Ackerman to come to Mayo Rochester and I spent some time with him out there on an internship you know really getting that high level training so I could bring that back here to people in Phoenix mm. and being able to uh you know do that deep dive into cardiac genetics for our population there is certain things that are very applicable that our patients or our citizens should be getting tested in things like cardiomyopathy family hyperlipidemia arrhythmias it's solid solid evidence for us and we call that precision medicine so if we know we have a genetic um, gene then that has amazing implications for our family so we always think of oncology right when we're thinking of breast cancer so imagine i had breast cancer and i was positive and let's say I say to my two girls, I shared with you, I got a 25 and a 29 year old daughter. And I said, hey, you guys gotta go get tested. Mom's positive. Mm-hmm. Does that mean they're gonna get breast cancer? N- not necessarily. No, I'm right. Yeah. But they might carry the gene, right. right? So we want, it's the same thing in cardiology. What would happen to them is they would go get mammograms, right? right? So in cardiology, they would go get their echo or they would go get whatever testing is appropriate for them. And we are able to do preventative medicine. We're able to get ahead of the curve, just like we would in oncology. And so it's super important. We don't always inherit a gene and express the gene. So we could have the gene for cancer, but not necessarily have breast cancer or show it, but that person's gonna get mammograms, same thing in the cardiology field. No, it's interesting. And you know, when I talk about my own parents, I mean, they grew up, you know, they they were born in the 30s and grew up in the 50s and, you know, talk about lifestyle. I mean, people that grew up in the 50s and and the early 60s, they were smokers. Mm -hmm. They were eating not well. They didn't really understand exercise. And all of those played contributing factors into their own heart diseases. Mm -hmm. So we we know so much more today. It's crazy when you look at some of the old movies and you see that, you know, they're smoking on an airplane or in a restaurant. And you're like, what? Yeah, How can that 100%. be? But there, there is that correlation to smoking and heart disease. It is, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, something we talked about at the break in, in terms of exercise mm-hmm. and, and how important that is. And, you know, so many people, you know, want to do a deep dive into it. And you talked about, you know, you know easing into it. And you talked about even yourself, you know, you know, when you do some traveling, you'll take a couple bands with you. You'll do, you know, some form of exercise. Talk to us a little bit about what we can do to have 
better hearts and healthier hearts. Yeah, so exercise is really one of the pillars of good heart health. And we know that we should have 90 minutes of intermediate exercise or 150 minutes of just regular exercise, moving our body. And that's not a day, guys. That's a week. Yeah. Sometimes people think that is a day, and some people do it in a day. I don't have that kind of time capital, and I know you don't either. I do not. But it's really important that we are getting out is the number one thing, moving our body. And so I tell people, so you can probably see the black bags under my eyes. I didn't get home since, since 11 last night. Mm-hmm. I was traveling and stuff. But I still make it a part of my day, whether that's 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or using my watch to see what's going on. So I pack bands with me everywhere I go. Resistance bands are amazing. Mm. And everyone, man and woman, should be incorporating resistance training into their regular routine. We start losing muscle at the age of 30. And so when we start losing muscle, you know, we lose that core strength, increased risk of falls, all kinds of stuff. And muscle also spins our metabolism, which really helps us with our calorie consumption and things like that. So we do want people to be moving their bodies using that. And then, you know, we talked about earlier, man, it gets hard in our 50s to lose weight, right? We can't eat like when we were in our 20s. Mm -mm. Life changes. So again, getting that resistance training is really, really beneficial. But, um, you know, getting some intervals out there, getting, don't do what you do all the time. What you did when you were 20 doesn't work when you're 50 or 60, those sort of things. So I tell my patients, you know, when you got that stubborn, perhaps weight that you're trying to shake off, if the runner runs the same route every time, he doesn't get any faster and doesn't, nothing changes, right? Right. What does he do? Hills, repeat, something. We're no different. So get out there when when you go to do your lap once a week, you know, not every day, do two houses at your regular pace, two houses super brisk so that the fire is burning. You and I couldn't chit chat on those two houses, but then we go back to the regular two houses and just do some intervals, you know, and and that will make a world of difference in your conditioning, your sleep, your weight loss, your metabolism, so many things. It's a game changer. No, totally is. You know, we have like about a minute left and that, you know, I want to make sure, is there a question I haven't asked or is Mm -hmm. there a a thought you want to leave with us? Uh, You know, I know you had a post uh, today about sudden cardiac uh, uh, arrest or sudden cardiac syndrome. Sudden cardiac death. Death, yes. Right. So I do have a message I want to leave. I want all the listeners to know today that one woman dies every 80 seconds in the United States. Whoa. Every 80 seconds. And that is a statistic we need to change. And so, you know, everything, I'm so honored to be here with you and us advocating for everybody out there that we need to change that data set. We need to keep working on that. And, um, you know, sudden death and all those things, it, we have poor outcomes. We talked earlier about how men get uh, CPR 45% of the time and women 39. That's a really startling statistic. So let's get out there, keep advocating and working hard to change the health care of our community. Well, I love the work you're doing and you are doing a great job getting it out there. And thank you for coming here on the show. I've been wanting to get you here on the show and the timing is absolutely perfect. You know, Heart Health Month, We need to have better hearts out there. And you've given our listeners some great tips to doing that. So Mia Chorney, I want you to mark your calendar for next February. I'd love to have you back here talking about women's hearts and heart health. Make it a great day. Have a great weekend. You've been listening to Health Futures. We'll be back next week. There's no place like home. You've been listening to Bob Roth's Health Futures. If you have questions about your own or your loved one's future health care, call Cypress Home Care Solutions at 602-264-8009. That's 602-264-8009. Or visit cypresshomecare.com. Be sure to join Health Futures with Bob Roth every Friday at noon, right here on Money Radio 1510 and 105.3 FM.